Hi, welcome to Save the Frogs Academy. This is Dr. Carrie Krieger. I'm the founder and executive director of Save the Frogs. And today we're going to be talking all about our efforts in Ghana. Save the Frogs Ghana is the first international branch of Save the Frogs. And I co-founded Save the Frogs Ghana in 2011, September 2011, two years ago, with Gilbert Adam, who is a biologist from Ghana and who is currently our executive director there. Gilbert was going to be on the line today to tell you all about their efforts, but they have pretty persistent internet problems throughout Ghana, and he's not connected to the internet right now, so I have his slideshow, so I'll go through that. I'm sure he can um, give you everything in more details, but you'll get a good overview of what's going on in Ghana with the frogs there and how we are educating people about environmental issues and helping to make Ghana a more frog-friendly place. Ghana is in West Africa, and we have a Save the Frogs Ghana webpage, savethefrogs.com slash Ghana, that you should certainly check out. In West Africa, about 90% of the original rainforests have been cut down. So when all that rainforest gets cut down, it causes a lot of trouble for the animals that live there. And so that's one of the main problems in Ghana. And I'm going to run you through a slideshow that I had prepared. Uh, give me one moment while I switch over to that. All right, that's me in Ghana in September 2011. And this is Gilbert, who um, is leading all of our efforts in Ghana. And there you can see Ghana, West Africa. When I went to Ghana two years ago, there was very little activity in the country uh, to educate people about the environment. And so students and the next generation of Ghanaians were not really growing up with much of an environmental ethic or knowledge, awareness about the importance of the environment. Uh, and they didn't have the tools then to help protect Ghana's environment far into the future. So one of our primary goals in Ghana has always been to inspire youth and students to pursue environmental careers. So when I was in Ghana, I gave talks in the middle schools and then also at the university. And we now have cha student chapters at about five universities throughout Ghana, and they are active uh, taking charge of a lot of our campaigns and educational programs, specifically the ones that are happening in their regions. Uh, for instance, we have a Save the Frogs chapter at a university that's right near the Atiwa Hills. And the Atiwa Hills are the most biodiverse region in Ghana. Uh, there's a lot of forest remaining there. And there are the Togo slippery frogs, which you can see here. And they are, they're critically endangered. They only live on two total streams in the world, both in the Atiwa Hills. And there's a constant threat from mining in the Atiwa Hills, both small-scale and large-scale mountaintop removal mining. There's also illegal timber harvests that take place in the park. And also the Togo slippery frogs are kind of big frogs, and people actually hunt them for their meat on their legs. So we're working on getting a Atiwa Hills National Park. We got good news a week or two ago that the um, permits that were going to be given out for the mountaintop removal mining in the park got denied, but there's still, as I said, constant threat from various activities in the park. So we really want the Atiwa Hills turned into a national park, which would be in the best long-term interest of Ghana and the wildlife there. 
in northern Ghana, there's a large trade in frog meat. And there's a few species that are certainly top of the list, um, generally large species that have a lot of meat on their legs. And so our university chapter up in the north of Ghana is working on educating people in the frog meat markets, getting people to choose other food sources. And then uh, one of our goals is to provide alternative incomes to the people by training them to um, do beekeeping and make honey or mushroom farming or various activities that people can, Ghanaians can do that will provide them with food, a food source and a monetary income so that they no longer have to go out and catch frogs to sell them in the market or to chop down trees in the forest. Uh, so giving people alternatives to harming frogs is very important in creating change. Ghana currently has no Ind Endangered Species Act, no Clean Water Act, no Clean Air Act. So you can imagine that the um, imagine the trouble that the wildlife have in that country, um, getting laws on their behalf to protect them and keeping them safe. There's all kinds of mining, logging, and um, cocoa harvest that takes place in Ghana. And all of these activities require a lot of deforestation. So here you can see some mining that's taking place. There's In Ghana, there's gold, uh, there's bauxite, and several other minerals that are in high demand. And some of this is done, as I said before, by large multinational companies. A lot of it is just small scale people walk out from their village, go out into the forest and start mining. And it's not only destruction of the forest, but there's all kinds of bad chemicals that leach into the water when the mining is done. And as you can imagine, these chemicals that are in the water cause problems for frogs and their tadpoles. Ghana also has a whole lot of pesticides being used, uh, just as we do in America. In Ghana, it's very uh, out in the open. There's lots of billboards in the streets promoting pesticides, advertising pesticides, and they're used pretty indiscriminately, and that can cause a lot of problems for the frogs. Save the Frogs Day is uh, an event that we hold each year at the end of April with the goal of uh, getting people educated about frogs. And we have had Save the Frogs Day events in Ghana that have been very successful. Here's a slide of me with the KNUST students. That's our original university chapter in Ghana. And they have been holding Save the Frogs Day events at their university in Kumasi, to educate both undergraduates and the local community. When I was in Ghana in 2011, there were only five undergraduates who were in the um, wildlife major, and now there's about 40 based on our efforts of getting people interested in protecting wildlife and specifically frogs. This is a parade that took place earlier this year in the north of Ghana on Save the Frogs Day, right out in the main streets to draw a lot of attention. And another Save the Frogs Day event uh, this year at KNUST, the university in Kumasi, where Save the Frogs Ghana is headquartered. And uh, the KNUST students just got approval from their university to do habitat restoration on the Weiwei River which runs right through campus and has 10 or 11 frog species. So it's a great way to get students on the campus educated about frogs and out there actively learning how to protect frogs and then doing something beneficial for the frogs that will get a lot of notice at the university, which is a very large university. And Michael Starkey, our Save the Frogs Advisory Committee Chairman, is on the line. He was in Ghana earlier this year giving presentations to students and uh, teaching classes in, uh, in 
in field techniques, monitoring amphibians for the undergraduates, and he'll tell you about that momentarily. This is a sign that our students made, and up in the north of Ghana, the students are working on the frog meat campaign. Uh, this was actually our KNUST students getting involved as well. So I'm gonna see if Michael is on the line, in which case I can put the screen over to him and he can tell you all about it. Michael, I'm gonna send it over to you. Great, thank you. Hi. Hi, get Welcome. set up here. Okay. Great, can you see that okay? Let's see. Yes. Cool. Okay, so I was um, in Ghana uh, in April of 2013, so not too long ago, and um, it was a great opportunity for me to, um, you know, meet with uh, staff and volunteers of Save the Frogs Ghana, and um, actually quite a bit other things um, I was able to do while I was there. And so um, to get started, here we go. One of the uh, when we started, it was to go into uh, northern Ghana because the overharvesting of um, frogs is a huge problem, and um, and this is mainly for food and for bait. And so we started. Um, well, when I arrived in Ghana, we met in the um, in Accra, and then we traveled to um, uh, the northern region near the uh, border, uh, which is uh, in Chiana and Navrongo. And there, people eat frogs. Uh, they sell the frogs in markets, but they also use them in bait uh, it, for uh, catching larger fish, like large catfish, and also catching crocodiles, actually. Then they can skin those crocodiles and use those. And so this is the frog that they use, which is the African tiger frog or crowned bullfrog. They're the largest frog in Ghana, and they are about the size of an American bullfrog, quite, quite large frogs. And so this is the main frog. Um, and while we were there, we met with uh, members of these communities to address these problems. And so, and we worked on trying to figure out what would be the best solution. And it came down to livelihood. Um, many of these people in the area didn't even want to go out and catch frogs. They have to go out at night. Uh, they have poor light, if they have any light at all. And uh, they, there's, you know, obviously there's crocodiles where there are venomous snakes, so they don't want to do the work. But they're it's come down to their livelihood. They're kind of running out of options. There's very little bush meat, and um, so we worked with them in trying to figure out solutions to these problems. And then we also raised awareness in these communities, um, and not only in the north, but also in other parts of Ghana too, by going on the radio. So radio is um, quite popular in Ghana, and we were able to give uh, many presentations actually, be interviewed, um, so that many people could hear this. And so uh, we raised um, awareness about Say the Frogs Ghana's various campaigns, whether it was over harvesting or um, you know not using pesticides, and just bringing awareness to um, some of the threats that frogs were facing, but also to get people um, interested in Save the Frogs Day. So when up north we started Save the Frogs Day actually a few days earlier than the official Save the Frogs Day, and we had a march in Chiana, which is this. Um, a town in, in northern Ghana, and we had about 200 people marching out for the frogs, and uh, it was a great event. Many people came out, and this was to bring awareness to this over-harvesting of frogs issue, and so the campaign was to say no to frog meat. And so we had a nice drumming for the frogs event, and you can see their shirts on there that say, say no to frog meat. Um, it was a really great event. And even some of the tribal leaders came out and showed their support uh, by allowing that march to happen in the town. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so we educated many people. Probably um, the, after the march was over, we had a gathering of about 500 people um, come out. Um, it was also market day, so there were many people out in the town hearing the message, educated lots of school children, gave presentations. And we also, um, from the United States, I brought lots of football gear, soccer gear, um, because one of the problems is that children, you know, when they get off school, uh, they immediately go out to the frog ponds and start catching frogs so they can sell them. And so this lack of um, things, things for them to do. So one, uh, one part of what Save the Frogs Gone is doing north is starting a football team there 
where they can get these kids uh, participating in sports rather than going catching frogs. And so we gave them jerseys and cleats and got them looking pretty good to save the frogs. So there's now a couple uh, football teams in Ghana now that these kids are, you know, not only are they going out being active, but they're learning about amphibian conservation efforts in their own country, and they're helping frogs in their own country. So it was great to donate it, all those, um, all that football gear to these kids. And then a few days later, on the actual Save the Frogs Day, um, at KNUST in Kumasi, the, one of the largest universities in Ghana, we had a, a very uh, big event where we had a few hundred people come out um, and learn about amphibian conservation in Ghana. And so we gave presentations and uh, rose awareness in the university in, and also in Kumasi as well. And so, and as uh, Dr. Krieger mentioned, we uh, also this is to bring awareness about the work at the Weiwei River, which bisects the university. And there's um, a lot of trash there um, in the river. There's a lot of pollution running into the river. And so restoring it would be great. And actually, this um, little frog here was the first frog that I found in Ghana. Um, while I was in Ghana, it was about two weeks in. Uh, I was so busy working with Save the Frogs Ghana, I didn't even get a chance to go out and look for frogs. But I happened to find this frog on this, uh, you know, basically in a trash pile. And I just thought it was quite interesting. That was the first frog I found. So very soon, they're going to be restoring the Weiwei River at KNUST. And also while I was there at the university and around the country gave many presentations about amphibian ecology and conservation. And so this um, group was at KNUST, but also when I was up in North and Chiana, we went to schools, educated hundreds of school kids about you know, amphibian conservation, about how they can help frogs and get their parents to help, their friends to help. And so it was getting this message, spreading this message around the country. So it gave lots of talks to hundreds of people. And so also while I was there, I was networking with um, you know, students. Um, as uh, Carrie said, we, have many, we now have many student chapters in Ghana. And these universities, uh, some of them have you know, tens. I think one, one university might even have 100 members of uh, Say the Frogs. And this is great. So it's so many university students that are interested in conservation efforts. And they're able to do a lot. We also networked with academics and biologists to help grow this amphibian conservation movement in Ghana. So, and this was that, uh, the first photo was at uh, KNUST, and this is at Presby University. And each university has their own theme, where KNUST is restoring the, the Weiwei River, and at Presbyterian University, they're actually working with climate change issues. They're in um, a part of Ghana where they're actually in, in highlands at high elevation. So they're going to be looking at climate change and the effects of chytrid fungus as well. So doing great work of these student chapters. And then also met with tribal leaders because one important thing to remember about Ghana is that um, you have to work not only with the government to, I guess, make change happen, but also with these tribal leaders because it's almost there's all, like two governing bodies. There's the official, um, you know, Ghanaian government and then in these local of regional kings and then you have uh, these other tribal leaders. And so it's very important that where I'm was going was to meet with these tribal leaders and um, this uh, gentleman here is actually the chief of this particular town and you know getting their support and saying hey this is why we're here this is what we're trying to do and then therefore they will then talk to the people in their community about hey okay listen to these guys they, they are legitimate and very very important to meet with these tribal leaders and gain support that way and then one of the um, last campaigns that I saw uh, well, assisted working with in Ghana was um, was visiting the the, the Atiwa Hills site where um, we're attempting to establish the sixth national park in Ghana, and visiting this site. Uh, this is uh, you can look at this photo and we see all these spoils of earth, and then behind that is the actual forest, the Atiwa Hills, and a sign that says you know uh, Asia Kwa Water and Sanitation Development Board no excavation. This blatant sign right here, but excavation continues. So while people are trying to stop this mining from going on, it's still happening. And so what this is is illegal bauxite mining. And so this is just some examples of what this forest is facing. Um, it's being clear cut at, at very alarming um, rates. And so the forest, uh, they're taking away the forest, um, ripping apart the earth, and then uh, there's not much left. Once they take away the forest, it becomes a desert. And so 
uh, this is a, an example of some of the workers here um, working um, at a bauxite mine, and they have a flume here, and they actually have to they get all the sediment out, and they actually pour lots of chemicals into it to uh, get the bauxite out. And many of them don't wear gloves; they don't have protective clothing. This gets back in. They're using lots of water, and that gets out into the the rivers, which people drink from. The local communities are not happy that this is happening. But this is a source of um, income for these men that are working out there, and so it's a problem that you know you have this uh, this problem where it's their livelihood, but they understand that it is a threat. Um, some of these communities also have blindness from these chemicals that are um, affecting them because they're drinking this water, and so many problems. And so this is kind of an example of what it looks like after the they've mined and left. Um, what used to be forest is now just scarred earth with you know sparse vegetation and so and some of these mounds are 30 40 feet high um, where they've dug and um, where they um, excavate these big, big pits they'll fill with rainwater and then you have this just um, very poor habitat for amphibians there's not this is not good habitat all this washes out into the stream you have lots of erosion and it's not good for the environment all this um, it just keeps um, there's also lots of chemicals in there from when they were mining but so this is the result of this heavy bauxite mining that's going on um, and so after we kind of saw it during the day well we thought we'd actually go and try and find the Togo slippery frog um, this frog is critically endangered um, named the Togo slippery frog because it was originally discovered in Togo it's now extinct in Togo and only exists in Ghana as far as we know and it only um, happens to live on two isolated streams in uh, the Atiwa Hills forest. And so we took a, a group of students from uh, a Save the Frogs chapter that's actually working to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, to uh, protect the Atiwa Hills forest and educating the community about the importance of having the forest. And we took a group out and we went looking for these frogs. And while we were hiking there, it was about a, a mile hike to the site, um, they have people that are actually coming out of the forest carrying logs and these men were quite startled to see us because they know what they're doing is illegal and so they're walking these boards in and out um, and so and this is kind of a common theme in the forest you have all these uh, areas where um, there are these small logging camps and they're illegally logging the, um, the wood out so another big problem is illegal logging and so we did find the Togo slippery frog, and it was great to see. Their numbers were actually quite plentiful. We, we found quite a few on the stream. Um, but it was kind of a shame because there's only about 300 individuals left in the world, as far as we know. And so, you know, while we can find these frogs very easily, um, that's not very good because the threats, um, the logging and the mining are just right on their front door. And so it's important that we act fast to help protect this forest if we want to save this frog from extinction. And so we found quite a few individuals this night, and they're quite a large frog. They're about the size of um, maybe um, an, a small orange. They're actually quite a good-sized frog. And so one big issue, too, is that people are going up here. Uh, if they're loggers or miners, they're going to eat this frog as well. And, um, and on our way out, this is literally maybe 20 feet from the stream. Um, this is an evidence of a... Uh, a, a campsite from a, a log logging camp and so there was trash and you know it's threatening that there's so close to the only habitat for this frog you know degra degrading the habitat so there are still many many threats that face the frogs of Atiwa and again as we were walking out that night we actually caught a man loading up a truck full of logs and so we confronted him and it was actually um, he was not happy to see us, but he knew he was in big trouble. And so while we were trying to report him to the authorities, he actually jumped in his car and he nearly hit one of the students and escaped. Left, uh, you know, left with the back door open, and so he did escape. But we, you know, were able to report him. But this is these are the real threats that are facing um, the Atuyo Hills Forest with so many illegal activities. Um, if we don't act fast, um, we will probably see the extinction of this frog, which is quite unfortunate. And so with that, Carrie, um, that's just some of the experiences that um, I'd like to share uh, during my time in Ghana, but I'll pass it on to you. Okay, thanks a lot, Michael.
All right, I'm going to switch and get Gilbert's slideshow. And Gilbert, as I said, was going to be giving a presentation all about his fine work in Ghana, but they have persistent internet problems in Ghana, and sometimes it's just not possible to connect. So this is the slideshow that Gilbert had prepared, and uh, it's not at the start. Give me one second here. Okay, so there's Gilbert, Adam, and myself in 2011 in Ghana, and Ghana has 78 different um, frog species and five toads and a Sicilian giving us 84 amphibian species. And there could easily be some more amphibians in the country that are just not yet discovered by scientists. And some special frogs. We've heard about all about the Togo slippery frog that's so endangered. And the squeaker frog's another critically endangered frog. There's just 12 of these frogs not 12 populations, 12 total frogs that are known. So uh, very, very close to extinction, but still in existence, we think. And they're in Western Ghana in the Krokosua um, Forest Reserve, Sui Forest Reserve. And we have been doing work to restore their habitat. They have non-native weeds that are living uh, or that are growing and covering up their habitat, which is creating problems because the weed is of a much different uh, vegetation structure than their native habitat. So we've actually gotten a grant or two to go in there and take local school kids up there planting seedlings of native trees and removing the bad weeds to create better habitat for the frog and also doing monitoring um, searching for the frogs, educating the local community about the frogs. Because again, in this forest reserve, Sui Forest Reserve, where the frogs live, uh, same basic problems with all kinds of illegal activities that are taking place there. So habitat destruction is the greatest threat in Ghana. And there's been a long history of chopping the rainforest there. And unfortunately, even though the forest is getting very, very small, uh, it's still going on, as we saw all those pictures from Michael. Uh, and it's not just to take out the forest to sell us timber. There's a lot of farming. Even, even on the campus in Kumasi at KNUST, the university there, there's illegal farming that takes place on the campus There's a, uh, there's a lot of wildfires in Ghana. Ghana, at least when I was there, was very dry looking. And as you can imagine, when you chop down rainforest, it changes the whole climate of the area. Places get drier when the forests disappear. And then, uh, you know, when fires sweep through, they can kill lots of wildlife. Invasive weeds are a huge problem, as I just said especially for the squeaker frog. Mining is a big problem. Overharvesting. Here we see some pictures of the frogs being cooked, especially in the north. And here's Gilbert at Ghana's largest frog meat market where they sell. I've seen pictures where there's piles of frogs that are uh, several feet high, just frogs piled up for sale. People use slingshots to kill frogs, uh, whether it's to eat them or to use them as bait. And uh, yeah, as Michael said, people are collecting frogs just so that they can go fishing with the frogs. Uh, one thing that we're trying to do is get some of the fishing tackle companies in America to donate artificial lures so that we can send artificial lures to some of these people in Ghana so that they won't have to go out and catch the frogs. The logging roads that get made uh, basically 
chop down trees to get the road in there. And then also the roads are made in such a way that they create a lot of puddles that are potentially death traps for amphibians because a lot of these amphibians, they may lay their eggs there, but the puddles are not natural and they may dry up sooner than puddles normally would. And then when the puddles drying up, the tadpoles, if they haven't metamorphosed, then they die. Frog dissections in Ghana, the way it works is that the student tells the teacher, sorry, the teachers tell the student to go out and collect a frog for tomorrow's dissection class. So they're being taken out of the wild, just as they are in many places in the world. So that's an additional threat to frogs we haven't heard about. Good news is there's been no chytrid fungus detected in Ghana, and hopefully it'll stay that way. It's a hot place. Chytrid tends not to like hot places, and so hopefully chytrid will not cause a problem there. So Save the Frogs Ghana has a lot of activity. This is at a presentation that I gave when I was in Ghana, and uh, we heard about the students leading the campaign to save the Atiwa Hills and the Say No to Frog Meat campaigns in the north. Michael was there getting some Save the Frogs football teams going to educate the local communities. And in Ghana, they're just about to um, get some shirts printed to raise awareness in the local communities surrounding the Crocosua squeaker frog and the Togo slippery frogs. And also Save the Frogs Ghana has given out um, nine small grants to students to help them with their research and to get them researching frogs so that they're knowledgeable about frogs when they graduate from their university and they have more interest in frogs. Here's another picture from our Save the Frogs Day events there in Chiana in the north. And we also have some um, great frog artwork coming out of Ghana to help spread the word. And we have some awesome Save the Frogs Ghana t-shirts. If you go to savethefrogs.com slash shirts, then you can find these shirts. They're 100% organic cotton. They look fantastic. They're great conversation starters. And all proceeds help support our efforts in Ghana. So, uh, we hope that you can donate to Save the Frogs Ghana. Just go to the savethefrogs.com homepage, click the donate link, donate, and then just send us an email saying to please direct your donation to our efforts in Ghana. And that would be fantastic. It goes, your donation goes so far in Ghana. We get so much done on very little funding in Ghana. So it would be great if you could help out. And Save the Frogs Ghana has been supported by various groups from around the world. So we send a thank you to all those groups who are supporting our efforts there. Okay, so on that note, if anyone has any questions, send them in. If Michael has anything final to say then feel free to um, jump in, Michael. And I'm just going to run you quickly through this SaveTheFrogs.com Ghana page. And you can get to this from the Save the Frogs homepage. Just scroll down until you see the Save the Frogs Ghana icon. So on this page, we've got info about Ghana. We've got an eight-point plan for saving Ghana's frogs with some major... Uh, priorities of how we're doing things there. We have a whole page about the Atiwa Forest Reserve. You can click through to learn all about Atiwa. We have an entire page dedicated to um, Ghana's frogs and toads where you can click through and see a ton of photos of cool frogs and toads from Ghana that you did not see today. So go check those out. Links to go get that awesome Save the Frogs Ghana shirt. We list upcoming events on this page, and it's also got lots of photos and stories of events that have taken place in the past.
So it's a great way to stay up to date. Here's some photos of me when I was speaking in uh, middle schools in Ghana, educating the kids. So yeah, check out the savefrogs.com slash Ghana page. There's a whole lot of stuff there. And I'm going to end it right there. And I thank you all for your interest in Save the Frogs Ghana. And uh, have a great day. We will get this video up to YouTube shortly. YouTube.com slash Save the Frogs. So check that out in a few hours. And if you have some friends or colleagues you think should see this video, please uh, forward it on to them and ask them to check out SaveTheFrogs.com slash Ghana. All right, I am Dr. Kerry Krieger, founder and executive director of Save the Frogs and co-founder of Save the Frogs Ghana, thanking you for your support. Bye.